I want to ask you something about the Bronx Tale. So, funny story. Well, not really a funny story. Interesting. I hadn't watched a Bronx Tale until this year, until a few months ago. The first time I watched it was a few months ago. And because I always saw the poster, I always saw, you know, Chaz and De Niro and that, you know, the face off, you know, the face off uh, photo of them just like facing each other. And I was always like, what is this movie? And then one night I was just like, I'm going to watch it. And man, it was so fucking good. And, you know, I want to get into De Niro is such a I want to talk about him a little bit because he's such an icon that my mom, I'm Iranian. I'm a Persian. I'm from Iran. And, uh, you know, my you know, my family, you know, were immigrants in the late 1990s. And even they knew about Robert De Niro. You know what I mean? Like they they were like kind of like shut off from the world, but that even they knew about him and, you know, guys like Michael Jackson, like Robert De Niro had that pull with a lot of people. He had that stardom and that, that aura about him that everyone knew. And what was it like working with him on set, man? Like, was he as intimidating as I feel like he is and was, you know what I mean? Like the first time you met, obviously you were nervous, right? Like, Oh, he was a, nice gentle man he was very you know i mean accommodating as you know as a director he he was very good with us he wasn't you know i mean of course he does it at a level that we'll never be able to do so he could have been like oh my god these people are driving me nuts just say it like this he wasn't like that he was very patient and he'd do as many takes as he needed to do but you know like he's got a son my age he's got a son Raphael, mm. who's like two year, two months younger than i am so obviously like you know that was natural the dynamic between us was a natural one because he has a son my age. <clears throat> so he know how to communicate with me being that he had a you know, son that age. So it was, no, it was great. It was great working with him. Right. I was always comfortable. And I did you speak on behalf of everyone else as well? And, and did you work together a little bit on the relationship? Did you have to build, like spend some time offset before actually going to production to try to sort of work on getting to know each other to get that? Or was that, did you have that chemistry kind of right away? Because it comes across, it's very evident in the the movie, the, the chemistry and the connection between you. But I'm not sure if that was developed, if that just kind of came out naturally or did you have to actually work on it a little bit? Like, did you have, did you have to go out to dinners with him and spend time at his house, that kind of stuff? No, we definitely spent time. You know, I was, you know, I remember he, he hurt his foot. I didn't remember, I think he hurt his sprained his ankle. So I remember we had to go to his apartment, you know what I mean? When we, cause we were there, I was down there in Tribeca, you know, the part of Manhattan. Do you know what that means? Tribeca? Yeah. Yeah. I've heard the, 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 the name. I don't know if I've been there. I've been, been to a but lot of But do you know places. what it means? No, try back. No, is there, no, I, yeah, what's, is there a meaning? Or? It's the triangle below Canal Street, Tribeca, because uh. you got Canal Street. When you're coming down, you know, east side, west side, it comes to this, and then there's Canal Street, right? So this little triangle to the tip, that's Tribeca. That's mm. good to know. So, okay. but that's like he's got so much real estate down there. He's got restaurants. He's got the you know Nobu, the sushi place. But uh, yeah, so we spent a lot of time. Every single day I was down there <clears throat> for one reason or another, whether it was trying on wardrobe, whether it was working with the music department, whatever it was, but he was always there. So, you know, eating lunches together, course, right. and downtime when there was nothing going on, you know, he'd ask me, so where did you go to school? And what did you, you know, you know, we did get to know each other and Chaz right. as well, too. So they, oh, cool. Sunny, Chaz, Tom cool. and Terry. Right. Yes. And was there an element of, you know, both of you being Italian where it made it became it was a little bit more comfortable in that sense where there was that there was that you know that similarity of just you know you know we're we're both italian um, like not I, really that i mean listen you know the character calogero is that's a sicilian name it's not italian it's sicilian it's like a little different you know what i mean right it's more slang it's more and my father was sicilian i was adopted when i was four months old from south america but i was raised by italian since i was a baby but my dad was Sicilian. I speak the dialect. I got relatives named Calogero. So like this name to me was very, I've heard it since I was a kid. My fa father went to a reform school in Sicily called San Calo. San Calogero. Calo was short for San Calogero. So this was like, not, this was nothing new to me as far as that. Um, so I, I guess he definitely appreciated that. Right. You know? Okay. Um, it was like almost like the role was made for me. It was like the yeah. perfect time. Because think about it. Say if I was 24 years old when they had this movie come out, I would have never got the part of C because right. I needed to be 16. 
Yeah. But you see how it worked out where I was the age when it, the movie was, when the film was made, because it was, you know, it's just meant to be. Yeah, you, you, know? were, you were acting your age. You were actually acting the age you were. Yeah. Yeah, I did. Go ahead. Well, the kid who shot Sonny at the end of the film, he was supposed to be C. He was 21. And oh, I wow. think he said he had the par for like seven months. But then they found me. And then, you know, they went with me just because it, I, I think it works better with a young kid. 16 yeah. year old kid is more impressionable, you know, from Sonny. Like at, at 21, you already kind of have your mind made up as to what you want to be and in which direction you want to go. So if Sonny came to you at 21 and you already had your mind made up, like, I'm not about this, I'm about this, it may not work the same way. But because he was 16, it works better. So that was that was all taken into account when casting. It was They were trying to make it as authentic as possible to the point where they were actually thinking about how old the actor is in real life just to, you know, make it as authentic as possible on set, right? Like... Because at twenty one year, a sixteen year old, you can still be molded into different directions. But a twenty one year old, it's kind of you can. They're still trying to figure it out, but they're a little bit more set in their ways. You're absolutely right. Wow. You know, so I just think I didn't know that the overall film just works better. I was just gonna say it's one but, of the, the the amazing things, and just as an outsider and and someone who loves movies, that's something that you always hear a lot of actors talk about it's just kind of the the whole movie magic and just the the right things came together at the right time to, produ to the final product ends up being something that you know it could have gone a completely different route like you like you said had they cast uh, a different slightly different actor maybe it's slightly different age even if you get a good actor sometimes it's, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to be a match made in heaven. And it obviously worked no. out perfectly for you in this movie. And it comes across beautifully. And one of the things I wanted to, act to ask you about, um, as someone who's very interested in the creative process, when you were on set as, at such a young age, watching not only someone like Robert De Niro, who's obviously known as an, an amazing actor, but to see him go behind the scenes, to see him direct and juggle that those two very different skill sets. What was that like watching him do that? And w were there some things that you, some lessons that you kind of took away and used? Uh, did that help you when you moved to the next project and so on and so forth? Oh yeah, of course. He, you know, he always taught me about subtlety and less is more. And even though it's not, you know, big words, but it's very, it's very effective. Less is more. So, you know, and he would say, like, you know, if you don't feel like doing anything, don't do anything. It's better than doing too much. Just little things like that. It's not a lot. But when you're really when you're there and it just, I don't know, it kind of calms you down. That direction kind of calms you down yeah. because you don't feel as obligated to do so much. Mm. Because this guy, the master, is telling you that less is more. Because on film, things come across bigger than sure. what they, 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 you know, the, in, all, in the way you did it. Um but as far as him juggling, directing, and acting, I'd never been on a set prior to that to really see how he was. Because I hear, you know, and I know for a fact that he really gets into his roles to where he's really method acting. And he's so you may go on sets where he's like playing something that's very different than who he is. He may, you know, he may want, you know, like on the sets, he may stay in a room alone by himself. You know what I mean? But for Bronx Tale, you know, you can really do that. And that character, Lorenzo, you know, that's more of what De Niro's like in real life yeah, than that, the, the bad guys I that was, he plays. I was going to say, yeah, in that movie, I have a feeling, I don't know Robert De Niro personally, but I feel like he was just being himself in that movie. Like, Yeah, that movie, like Goodfellas, people think like he was that. But Goodfellas, like, People think that's an easy role to play. I know him personally, and I know, I know how he is. I know his mannerisms. I know his personality. Mm. And everybody thinks that Goodfellas would just come easy. No, that was a stretch. Trust me, that was a stretch. And he did it so perfectly. He just looked so hard with the hair, just the way he walked with the forearms. Yeah. Well, I think it that's was like every new every nuance, every nuance was perfect. I think that's a, everything. He was such a tough guy yeah, in that movie. Yeah. When he was on that phone, remember he was on the phone and he's looking at, remember he's looking at Henry through the glass and he's calling up and he finds out that Pesci got killed. 
Watch that scene. Just watch the little faces he makes before the guy answers it, the phone. And he's looking at Henry. Yeah. His facial. Perfection. Yeah, his facial yeah, is just. It's perfection. Just Nobody unreal. can do th what his face, with their face, what De Niro does. Yeah. Just think of that scene like in Goodfellas with the cream song. Dan, 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 dan. And it's just his face. And it's so interesting just to look at as he's smoking that cigarette. Oh. That movie's unbelievable. It's amazing. It's not. It's so easy to watch because it's so well shot and just everything about it. And Leota's voice and the narration is so good. Right. Because he like he used Scorsese used a lot of steady cam POV. You know, when you hold the steady cam with the stabilizer, and he would he would use steady cam and it would be Henry's POV, his point of view, just like in the beginning. Remember when he introduced all the cameras? There was me, all the all the characters. There was me, there, there, Tony, hey, hey, what's up, guy? He's the camera. He's the camera as it's going like this, and he's introducing all the guys. It was the same thing. Remember when he walks in the diner, but you don't see him? He's the camera, mm -hmm. and he's talking about your murderers always come with smiling faces. They're usually the people you knew for your whole life, and they come, at, they come to you at the worst time, and then you see Jimmy's head pop out. Remember he's in the booth? Mm -hmm. as soon as mm -hmm. they, and they always seem to come at the worst time. And then you just see Jimmy's head pop out. Hey. Mm -hmm. he's like, oh. I think I think the trio of you, De Niro, and Chaz in the Bronx in the Bronx Tale is the perfect trio. Like I don't watching movies like that that really move you and become cult classics, you can never imagine anyone else playing those roles. Right? Like everything worked so well. Like the only other guy that I could cause you know, he's my favorite actor ever, favorite movie ever, Al Pacino, Scarface. I would say Pacino maybe could have played Chaz, maybe could have played Lorenzo, maybe, I don't it's know. It's interesting that you say that. Yeah. It's interesting that you say that because Martin Bregman, the Bregmans, yeah. they did Scarface, mm -hmm. Sea of Love, Carlito's Way. Al Pacino was their guy, like, like De Niro Scorsese's guy. Brian De Palma, Martin Bregman, Pacino's their guy. That's why they did all those films with him, right? They optioned the script. Sonny was supposed to be Pacino, and De Niro was always going to be Lorenzo. Wow. But you know what? I don't know. It, it you know worked what? out. Like, Chaz yeah, Pullman yeah. Terry absolutely destroyed the role. He uh, was yeah, amazing. Yeah, because you know what it is? He was fresh. Nobody knew who he was. And, you know, De Niro may as well have been somebody no one ever seen because he never plays those roles. He was playing the our average hardworking guy, something we don't see. So that was not typical. So that was great. And then you got the star power included in that. And now you got this guy, Chaz, who knows the material better than anybody because he wrote it. And usually when you see gangsters, they're more like stout and more portly and chubby. And yeah, you know yeah. what I mean? But now you got this tall, lean guy. But he's, you know, he's he's from there, so he's gonna come across the right way, and I think he was, I think he was picture perfect. I think, yeah. Like a lot yeah. of times, like, see, for me now, it's like not the same. I don't look at movies the same way. Mm. A lot of people want to watch movies because it has big names in it. I'm the opposite. A lot of times, the big names is what distracts me because I know that so and so, and I know that so and so. But you're trying to convince me that it's this person and this person. But it's not that their acting is not good, but they're so iconic and they have become such a, you know what I mean? Mm. Such a presence and such a, you know what I mean? That right. it's hard because it's like I'm more watching their acting and like, oh my God, that was pretty cool how he did that. You know what I mean? To where I'm losing the story. Like, yo, you know what? Let me rewind that. Let me see what they just said. Where when I watch, like sometimes I put these movies on, I don't recognize anybody. You can follow the story because you're not really, you know what I mean? Right. You're actually looking at the story. I don't know. It's just different. But um, yeah, I that's actually a good um, the the you know you pointed out that De Niro never plays that role. I actually want to segue into this. It's it's amazing to me. I, I want to ask you about what had happened after the movie came out and it became so popular and it became such a cult classic. Were people beginning to want to be like Sonny because I remember like I don't know where I heard this but after Scarface came out everyone wanted to be a gangster everyone wanted to be you know the top dog the 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 kingpin and you know he, there, 
the influence that Pacino had in that movie actually made people act like that. And one thing that, you know, I always think about is like human nature. When I was watching that movie, like when I first watched The Bronx Tale, I'm not going to lie to you. I was more drawn to Sonny in a way where it was more, I wouldn't say, uh, for lack of a better term, more attractive to be that type of guy. You know what I mean? Like, it was more of, you know, there was a scene where, um, you know, you in the movie say, you're you're a loser, dad. Like, you know, like you, you're a bus driver. The working man is a sucker. The yeah. working man is a sucker, right? And it's also it's also a little weird because De Niro is playing that part so it's kind of like how I don't want to you can't you can't think he's a sucker it's De Niro right but do you feel like after that movie came out more people were wanting to be like more like Sonny than than Lorenzo which is insane because you know when you watch that movie you see you know, uh, Sonny is a is a mobster. He's doing bad things. He's on the wrong path. And in the end, he does, you know, spoiler alert, he does get killed where, you know, Lorenzo's a working, you know, honest man providing for his family. Logically, it would make more sense for people to gravitate towards someone like De Niro and want to emulate that. But surprisingly, I don't know what it is. And personally for myself, I was more on the side of, you know, wow, like Sonny is just that dominating alpha male figure. And I mean, what do you have to say about that? Like, did you see a shift in culture when people watch that movie after? Like, were people thinking, oh, well, which side do we want to go on? Who do we want to be more like? I think just because a lot of these films glamorize that lifestyle, that I think it's a very easy decision for like kids coming up to what they want to be. You know, you heard what De Niro said. It's not, it's about, it's not about the car, you know, it's about the clothes. It's about the cause. It's about the money. I don't want my son around this. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Cause it's like, you see that and every kid wants nice things. You guys see this guy's got a nice car. He's got this, he got this. This guy could barely afford good seats at the boxing fight. So it's very easy to make that decision. But you know, that life is not always like that. It's, 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 you know, it's not glamorous at all. Mm. And one movie that I think did a good job in showing that it wasn't glamorous was Donnie Brasco. Because think about that. Those guys were busting open parking meters. And look at Lefty. He was like a broke down, you know what I mean? Just He was just, he was not even, he was alive, but not living. He was just existing. He was just basically a soldier. Just there to go kill people and do what he had to do. And he showed like, and just look at the way he went out. There was nothing glamorous about that movie, about Donnie Brasco. You had this guy. He was doing his job, Joe Pistone. You know what I mean? Donnie Brasco. Mm -hmm. He was doing his job. And that wasn't glamorous either. Look, he couldn't see his family. He had, you know, his family was in danger all the time. But this is what he did. This is what he was. Mm -hmm. And I think if they made more films like that one to kind of like show that this is, you know, the portrayal of this stuff, if it was more negative, people would say, you know what? I don't want to be like that. But because yeah. they, you know, like a movie like Goodfellas, well, Goodfellas, you know, it wasn't, you know, it had some glamorous moments. They robbed the airport. They had all this and that. But at the end, you know, it ended up the way it did. But right. I think Donnie Brasco, I think that was sad all the way through. Yeah. With right. yeah. Lefty, think about it. His son was a drug addict. You know, he had no money. That's I mean, terrible. It's, yeah. I, that's the way it is. It's, yeah, that's really what it is. That's the most tra uh, honest way of portraying a mobster. It's not It's not really necessarily Scarface and all the all the money and the big house and everything. No, and, it's not. But it's know. like they were breaking open parking meters because, you know, you become, you know, like you become, you know, a wise guy. You become a member. It's like now it's like you're part of a, you know, you're part of an organization. And, you know, you, you make, you work your way up and the way you do that, it's not only, you know, like people like the violence is, yeah, of course it's the linchpin, you know what I mean? To making all this other stuff work. But if there's no need for violence, it's much better off that way. You know what I mean? But like, it's all about making money and mm. it's, you know what I mean? And it's all about making money. Yeah. So, and you have to kick up a certain amount every month or whatever it is. And just the way it's structured, it's structured with captains and crews. That it's like it's a lot of pressure. People think it's out to dinners and this and that. It's like you have to come up with this. 
you know, like you, you, you're on to some guys and you have to make sure that you earn. That's a lot of pressure. That's not glamorous. Right. It's really not. Yeah. You know, and then you start doing things that, you know. Uh, absolutely. Uh, you know, it's funny. We're talking about like how these movies portray gangsters as this kind of glamorous lifestyle too. But I like, I can go the opposite way. Cause I, I, one of the things I love about De Niro's character in Bronx Tale is I, there's a certain vulnerability to him as the everyday kind of guy. And I, I connect more, I don't know about other people. I connect more with the average person because like, to me, that's, to me that as like, just as, as a man, like what he's trying to do, I connect more with, with that because it's easier to bully. It's easier to commit acts of violence against a, a, a weaker person. But to me, someone who is trying to provide for their family, who's trying to just make ends meet, who's trying to give a better life to their, to their son or daughter. Like to me, that's, that's strength. And I really connect with that. You're absolutely right about that. You know, look, I got my dad, that's my screensaver right there. There you go. Nice. Let me, you know, let me Beautiful. tell you something. My dad, my dad is a, is a, is a Sicilian immigrant. He came here with nothing. You know what I mean? He came here with nothing. He had four sisters, two brothers, and he was the oldest one. Yeah. And let me tell you something. My father, when he came here, he was 16, 17 years old. He did whatever he had to do. To, he worked at Fern. It's crazy. He worked at this place, the Ferncliff Mausoleum. And now that's where he's in the wall. Now that's where he's dead. He wow. worked there. And now he's dead in the wall. But wow. you know, he construction. Yeah. You know, my dad was a uh, he was a member of the union. He was a member of uh, the local local twenty seven. It was called BAC, bricklayers and allied craftsmen. My yeah. dad was a craftsman. If yeah. you, I'll show you houses. My dad, the brick you could look from the side of the house and see the joints and just the perfection. Yeah. There was this one place he, at this, I mean, my father was great. He like, was you know, the real tough guy. The, that's that's the yeah. real consummate tough guy. I, I, not, I could totally I relate to that I would smell that too. espresso in the morning. <laughs> I would smell that espresso in the morning because I know he's making it to go to work. Yeah. It'd be so frigging cold out. I mean, you Canadians know about the cold more than sure. us. I don't know about Vancouver, but Montreal, Toronto, Brutal. Oh, yeah, oh, we, we, don't, we don't get It's snowing in yeah. September over there. It's snowing in September. It's crazy. Yeah. Um, I would you know, see my dad getting up those early mornings when it's Saturday, I know I'm off. I could sleep. Yeah. You know, when he's going out there in the cold, just like in Bronx there, like he said, day after day after day, that is tough. Mm. I really relate to that. You the could typical just one day say, oh, screw this, you know? Typical immigrant, uh, you know, s story. I, I totally relate to that because my, I've got both Spanish and Greek blood in me. My, my, my dad was born in Greece and came uh, to Canada. Uh, you know, he was, I think, 19 or 20 with almost no money and just did every sort of job and tried to go to school and get an education and eventually started a family. He was a really young man when he, when he got married, you know, he was 24 or 25 when he had me. Uh, so, and my grandfather too, my grandfather, uh, both my grandparents, they're from Spain. So they came, they came here, you know, and they started a business and, uh, my grandfather, I mean, a lot like your dad too, was, uh, he was into the, uh, he had a cabinetry, a very successful cabinetry, uh, business and, uh, was good with his hands. And I learned a lot from him and appreciated, you know, as someone who loves attention to detail, I learned that from him because, because he showed me that stuff and to, to those little things matter. And I've carried that through in life too. So I can totally relate to that. Those little details separate goodness from greatness. Absolutely. Those little details are what makes you great. And that the emphasis on those details, and when you pay attention to details like that, mm -hmm. Robert De Niro, like, cause that was the first film we did. That was the first film I ever did. So I'm on that set and the way he would pay attention to detail. I just thought it was a standard thing. That's what they do. Yeah. But then when I worked on other films, I said, Oh, it's not like that. It's really not like that. He was like that. Mm -hmm. And now you know why the film, you know, I mean, I've been in other successful films and I'm not putting anybody down, but his attention to detail is something that I'll never forget. He would cut if the tie wasn't straight. Like, no one would even notice that. I worked on other movies. I had a different haircut every other day. It's like, it didn't even match, but wow. nobody knows. You know, but you would never know. I would know because I was like, oh, look, look right there how short my hair is. And then watch that. See how much longer it is? No one would really know. No one know even that. noticed. No one even would care to Robert say anything. Robert De Niro, mm. he would make sure it was the same. The tie, everything. Detail. Every little detail. And I'm, a, I'm about that too. That's why he's when the I greatest. When I write, I write a lot of detail. Right. Well, that's why he's the greatest. Tell us a little bit more about that. What's your, what's your, uh, so obviously you started acting and then you, how did you get into the whole writing thing? Is that something that you're super passionate about now? Well, you know what it is? 
It's something I was never really passionate about, but I have so much life experience. I've done so much in my life. I've made movies with some of the best. I've been, you know, some of the best television shows ever. I've been to friggin' jail. I've been, you know, this, you know, this, I've been shot. This, I, drug addiction, overcoming drug addiction, inspiring people, you know, so much I've, that I have so much to draw from. And, you know, the authenticity is there. I watch a lot of this other stuff that's big productions and there's not authenticity. Mm. I've watched shows about like, these are big shows on HBO, like about jail. It's just not real. It's just not real. And I'm thinking they have millions of dollars to do that. And it's not even real. I know what it is. I can remember what it smells like. I'm going to make this so real. You'll smell the piss in the hallways. Like, mm. wow, that was real. I lived it. So it's like, now I have a reason to write because I have so much to say. And it's like, I don't want to like, at least cause listen, you know, at the end of the day, I know it's the elephant in the room, but somebody lost their life. You know, Daniel Enchaltegui lost his life at the hands of my addiction. You know what I mean? So rather than to, you know, go back and make all these same mistakes again, mm -hmm. I'm an artist. I love to make art, you know, films and stuff like that. And these bad experiences and these things that I went through in my life that shaped me to become who I am today are definitely very worthy of putting on film. And some people will be shocked to see some of the things, but it's not about the bragging. It's more about like, I can make some beautiful art based on what I've seen with mm. these two eyes, mm. based on what I felt. I remember viscerally what I felt and just like, you know, and I'm going to make you feel that mm. the way I shoot it and the size of the frame and the camera that I'm going to, you know what I mean? All that, this is what really gives me excited. Bring the viewers in. Excited. I wrote a film. Yeah. Bring the viewers like, into your life, into your, what you experience and, keeping it real and like doing it from a place of genuine, genuine and genuinity, and I guess genuinity. is the word. Right? Yeah, exactly. I, I guess. And, and would yeah, you say I, that that those life experiences too, do you find that they inform you as an actor? They actually help you be a better actor because you've got those real course, world experiences. Course. Okay. Listen, like, you know, in business or in anything else, you always want to try to find what your competitive advantage is, right? Say if I'm, I got a dry cleaning business, what do I do better than the competition? Well, say I just bought these new bristles that clean the clothes. It's cutting edge and no one else has it. That's my competitive advantage. I can say one of my competitive advantage over other actors is that I have maybe more real life experiences, things that I've seen like from being plucked from a obscurity on Jones Beach is one totally different thing from being shot in the Bronx and someone dying and being charged with murder. Those are two things at opposite ends of the spectrum. And then I told you I grew up in a middle class, you know, middle class family, my dad, you know, middle, you know, hardworking Italian immigrants and everything else that I've seen in between. So there's so much. Right. And I feel that I can articulate myself in a way which will really be impactful with the films that I make. Cause like, damn, cause I, you know, like, I'm not some filmmaker who can imagine what doing drugs is like. I did do drugs mm. and I know the consequences and I know the, the nuances, the things that people feel and what leads up to the doing of the drugs. This is all stuff that I write very accurately. I do this. You can't, I write the story that I'm writing right now. You can't stop me and say, well, Hey, if this happened, why did this happen? All the, all, everything's tied together mm. and it's just getting better. What I realized, I knew I heard it. But now I know for myself, when you write things down, forget about anything else. It's good to have it here, but you got to put it here. Because when you put it here, it's much easier to keep writing. Right. You know what I mean? Right. I, what I did was because I had a story. I wanted to make it about addiction. Not necessarily drug addiction because my character is a gambler. And then my daughter inherits the addictive gene because of the trauma that she goes through with her upbringing with me being a degenerate gambler. And the, 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 the mom is going to be the girl from a Bronx tale. And, you know, like I work, you know, this is where I see that right there. More life recovery. Right okay. On. Yeah. I'm there. That's, that's, that's where I, I don't really go to meetings or anything like that. I, I don't frown upon it, but that's just not for me. Mm. But what? I'm here every week and I work with kids and I try to bring these poor drug addicted kids back to their parents safe and sound. Right. Cause you know, you get people and they're like, Hey Lilo, what do you do now? <laughs> Cause they think it's like, you don't do movies. Like, you know, they your whole world is like, I think I do something 10 times more meaningful. Okay. Yeah. I've made movies, 
But you tell me what's more meaningful. Mm. Me being in a movie and being seen with this one and this one. I respect or that. Bringing yeah. someone's child back to yeah. them safe and sound when they were close to dying and, because they were in the grips of addiction. That That's better yeah. feeling for me, for someone's parent to say, hey, Lilo, thank you so much. It was like, you know, you were a big part of my daughter or my son getting better. But don't get me wrong. You'll also get the people, you know, you'll get someone, some mom that will call you and say, hey, Lilo, I just wanted to let you know, thank you for everything you did for Brett. But he overdosed and died. And, but, you know, you get those calls Oh, my as well. God. Oh. But this is the kind of stuff like seeing and hearing the stories is what compels me to write. Because some of this stuff is so bizarre and people wouldn't even believe it. But I know it's real because I'm hearing it from the source that's real. Right. You know what I mean? Lil, I want to ask you one question. I don't know if you want to get into it um, about a little bit about your journey with addiction. I don't want to get too into it, but I just have this curiosity that's been on my mind um, ever since I heard your story. And one thing I want to know is, so from I from one of the podcasts I listened to, you were as you were as you were filming a Bronx Tale. You were within. You were still. You were doing drugs um, while that filming was happening. That was like you were in it as it was going. The on. Bronx Tale. The Bronx Tale. Yeah, a Bronx Tale. Yeah, I barely smoked weed though. No, I wasn't doing drugs. Right. I smoked pot for the first time, so that I don't even really consider that. Right. And so when I eat drugs, I think cocaine and you know stuff like that. Right. Right. And so was it after the movie was released where everything started spiraling out of control was it no, not there it was just that the access became a, you know it was a lot easier and more accessible just you know coming out and being at these parties and all this stuff and it's just so common so many people do it and it's not frowned upon that you start doing it but a lot of these people that are doing it they don't have that addictive personality where they're wired a certain way that they you know but I, I, I am wired that way. Right. And, you know, you don't know that because you have no experience. You're a little kid coming into all of this. And, you know, they could do it and go to sleep the next day and go to work. But then it's someone like myself, as I was getting more, more, you know, more, more pulled into it. I just felt like I couldn't let go. And it just became more right. part of, you know what so, I mean? So that I, you kind of answered my next question where I was wondering if the Bronx Tale, if the Bronx Tale never happened and you never met De Niro, you never made the movie and, you know, you never made all of the money and the fame came, you, do you think you still would have ended up going down that path or you wouldn't have? I do. I do. I do. Mm. I saw a psychiatrist when I was a kid. Um, his name was Dr. Lupiani. He's literally right up the street from my mom because they gave me a list. I was a bad kid in school in Mount St. Michael Academy in the Bronx. And they suggested that I go see someone. And they gave me a list of doctors. And then there was a slurry guy up the street. I used to ride my bike there. His name was Donald Lupiani. And uh, I spoke to him before I was on drugs and after. My mom, because I was got into drugs, my mom said, you should go see Dr. Lupiani. Maybe he could talk to you and tell you why you're doing what you're doing. And I remember when you know, I was a kid, I would go there. We'd play pool. And his office always smelled like polo. The green bottle, oh, the yeah. gold, the yeah, polo. Yeah. Oh, oh, yeah. That's the air conditioning and the polo. I'd sit in the back, lay low, boom, and I'd come up, we talk. And he definitely knew what he was talking about. And he always said, even this is before, he always, you know what he always said? You would be good in the dramatic arts. He said you would be a good actor. So that's why I went back because I knew the guy was spot on. He knew what he was talking about. And I remember one time we had a blizzard and he was like, because I thought he's right up the street from my mom's. So there was no driving really. So we were walking the streets. He's shoveling the snow. And this is after a Bronx tale. And he goes, I told you you'd be a good actor. And he was right. He was 100% right. But uh, Lupiani. So then I went to see him. And I said, you know, my, you know, I said, you know, like I'm dabbling in the drugs and that whole thing is starting to happen. And my mom and my brother and family attribute me using drugs to being adopted and, you know, not having that closure. I didn't really give a shit about that. I got to be honest with you. Mm -hmm. I think about it here and there. Oh, I did. I don't really anymore. For what reason? It doesn't really serve a purpose anymore. Right. I am what I am. Those people that gave, you know what I mean? I'm never going to, and it's just like, there's no reason to. The only thing for maybe some kind of genetic predisposition or some kind, you know, if you're genetically cancer, you know, that's the only reason why. But other than that, but 
he said, no, I don't. I, he, said, I, he said, I agree with you. I, I think that you're, I think that I knew, he said, I knew you would be someone. He said, you always had that need for speed. The things you would always talk about was always high adrenaline. Mm. And I knew eventually you would gravitate to drugs and alcohol. Wow. Okay. And he was right. You know, so, no, he knew. He it's knew. my personality type. Right. And, and just, you know what? Here's the thing. It, it may have been worse. It could have been better because I wouldn't have had the money or the access. But then again, it could have been worse because I wouldn't have been in the spotlight. So I wouldn't have given a shit as much about what people think and who sees me right now, what I'm doing. Right. I would have maybe been a total derelict because I would have had no, there would have no, been no accountability. Right. I would right. have been held to no accountability whatsoever. And I just would have went nuts. Right. Because that's the kind of personality. But now I keep it in check, obviously. Mm. I've you know acquired the tools over the years and just trial and error, just doing things for so long. And then just realize it's not working. And I just, and you know, sometimes can pull myself together and I'm smart enough to realize I got to go in a different direction now. Right. But it takes work. It doesn't just happen to be able to do that. You know, it takes work. Some it people think work. because they can't do it, they'll never be able to do it. You mm -hmm. will be able to do it, but you got to want to be able to do it. And you have to take the steps and work toward that happening. It's not mm. just going to happen by itself, right? You know, that's really interesting. That you said that, yeah. I didn't think of it that on on that pers on that side of it, where if you weren't in the spotlight, you wouldn't have given a shit, and you might have, you know, gone down even deeper than you you did go, right? That's right, because, like, you know, you kind of have like that, like that reputation now. You know, you're like this De Niro prodigy. You're this young kid. The movie was great. And, you know, you're out and about and, you know, the years go on. People, you know, you did this film and this film. People know who you are. So that's always in the back of your mind. Like mm. maybe instead of sniffing two lines right now, I'll only sniff one because I don't want to go out there with all these people all geeked out. But where if they didn't know me, I don't give a shit. I would have sniffed the whole bag. Mm. And I would have just been like, you know. Right. I mean. But who knows? I yeah. mean, the thing with addiction, it's it's becoming more and more prevalent in our society and our culture. And we've had a couple of guests, we've had a guest on, a couple of guests on um, who've, you know, dealt with their own addictions and, you know, how they overcame it and they're continuing to, you know, work on it. And, you know, it's just one of those things where it's, we and we had this talk with the guests that we had on. If you had an alien come down from Mars and we sat... The, we sat them down and said, this substance right here will make you happier. And this will make you feel like you're on top of the world and make you feel more powerful than anything. Obviously, the alien would be like, why wouldn't you take it? Why wouldn't you want to feel better than, you know, than you should and feel amazing? So with me, like, you know, I'm starting to, you know, think about it. And, you know, the talk we had with our guests, it's just sort of addiction is one of those things It's you kind of have to accept accept it in a way where you have to have compassion and tell yourself, well, you know, I don't blame myself for doing this. I don't blame myself for taking this drug or this, t this hit or watching porn or gambling because it makes me feel good. And naturally, why wouldn't you want to feel better? Why wouldn't you want to feel good? Right? And yeah, But then that, that means that someone needs to stress. That's why it's, you know, it's important to have good people around you mm. where you may be thinking that right? But then you have good people around you. They don't stress the good things. They stress the consequences. Yeah. But if you do this, yeah, it's, it's, you know, things that bring us, uh, things that give us instant gratification seldom lead to long-term happiness. And that's just the way it is. That's just these things, these drugs, this is all empty bullshit. This is smoke. This is, these are empty promises. It lasts for so little, but the consequences are so dire and they can last forever. Look at myself. You know, someone, you know, someone once told me it takes a second to get into trouble and a lifetime to get out of it. And I'm a perfect example of that because I'm still getting out of it. Like I'd mentioned before, there's still people, there's still people, you know, you know, with the cop killer and all that. And that's going to be for the rest of my life. Mm. You know what I mean? Right. So that's why it's, you know, th these are the consequences. People need to stress that mm. when you do these drugs, forget about how good you're going to feel and all this other shit. Think about when you do these drugs, you're not going to be yourself and you're not going to make good decisions. And it takes that one bad one that you'll never be able to, to overcome. Mm. And this is what happens. So if you some, you know, and it's like a support system is, is a big part of recovering and be, and being and staying sober. I look at recovery, you know, 
I look at recovery like a ladder, right? You're climbing the ladder. You're trying to get up here, trying to get up here. You're climbing the ladder, right? When you have support system, you have all these people underneath in case you fall. They pick you up. So now say you're all the way up here. You got no support. Boom, you fall all the way to the bottom, right? Mm. It's very hard at that point to pick yourself up and go all the way back up. It's, it's people throwing the towel. They're like, I'm not going through this shit again. Mm. You know what I mean? But where you have that support system, this guy, you know, he fell eight steps. You only fell two because the people that have you back were right there. Right. And they stopped the slide. So now it's like, no, 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 no. Pick yourself back up. Go, go. And then it's like, all right, this ain't too bad. I only lost two steps. I got these people around me. They're going to do whatever they have to do to help me climb those two steps again and then get the other two until, you know what I mean? Mm. I wouldn't you know, I, some people, I don't consider myself better than the next guy who didn't get sober because you don't know that guy may not have had the opportunities like I had or the support that I had. I couldn't have done this alone. This mm. is a, this is a joint effort. This is why they got things like Narcotics Anonymous. It's like, you know, we can do this. You may not be able to do it alone, but together we can. Right. You know what I mean? And they form the bond, you know? Yeah. Like Narcotics Anonymous, for me, um, it's a little too rigid. You know, there's people that go for, you know, 20, 30 years. I don't see the, I, I don't see the need for that whatsoever. Mm. If in 20, 30 years you're still struggling and thinking you want to go back, something is wrong. Mm. People are feeding you the wrong things. They're feeding you the wrong things that you're putting in here that after 20 years, yeah, it can always come back. But that's like anything else. You know what I mean? You, you could make other stupid decisions in other areas. But I think in 20 years you didn't acquire. I don't need 20 years later to be told I have a disease that never goes away. And, you know, hearing all these people come new. Yeah, I mean, yeah, we got to help the newcomer look out. But I just don't know if that's the best place to do it. You, you have phones and you got, you know, ways people can get in touch with you. You can stay plugged in that way. But as far as me, 20 years later, you know, I got 16 years in past November. So I'll have 17 years. I don't need meetings. I've been around stuff that I taught myself that, you know, and I think it just helps me when I know that I can get better. Or if I'm told I have a disease that never goes away. Sometimes that's not motivating because mm -hmm. mm -hmm. it's like, why get better when I'm told that I really never truly could because I have this thing inside me that's going to always be there. But, you know, like when my mom, like when my dad died in 2018, my mom and dad slept in different rooms because my dad was sick for a while and he had that special bed and, you know, the whole thing. He had his own little with all the stuff that he had medically that he medically needed. We set him up in his own room. Mm -hmm. He died June 24th, 2018. So it was like October of 2018. My mom said, clean out your father's room. We're going to start throwing all that stuff away. A lot of the stuff that he had in there, we're going to throw it away to see if people need it. So, of course, he's got, you know, cardboard boxes with all filled with medication. Now I'm looking through all the stuff and I see OxyContin. I see it. I'm on parole at this time, mm. but I max out December 26th and I did five years. I'm on my last two months. So trust me, I never gave them a problem ever. Not even vibe, not even went over curfew once. I never did anything wrong, but people don't talk about that on the news. Mm. They talk about cop killer, but how about talking about the way I've gotten better? Because that's what really counts. You right. know, do you, are you going to say you're the same person you were in 2005? No. Nobody is. Nobody. Yeah. Let me just say the final part of that thing. Yeah. I found the right. OxyContin, right? And they tell you it's a disease that never goes away. I proved to myself that day it's not like that. Nothing happened to me inside where I was trying to make deals with my own mind to justify me getting high. I knew exactly what that stuff was, exactly what the consequences were going to be, and I was disgusted by it. Because the way I feel, I don't have a disease. It was a spiritual disorder. Something was wrong with my spirit back then. Mm. I figured out what it was, and now I'm able to live in a way where I don't have to get high every single day. I get high off the treadmill and working out. You just got to redirect it. Mm. When you say disease, I mean disease. There's people with stage four pancreatic cancer. Trust me, they would trade you your disease for theirs in two seconds. 
I just never bought the word disease. I think it's very self-defeating, and I don't think you can ever truly get better. All right, go back to what you were saying. Well, I was just going to say about, about uh, you know, choosing to focus on one negative side without also looking at the other sides of what somebody has done to change their lives, obviously, in, in your example, a perfect example of this. But, you know, when someone says something silly on social media that they said 15 years ago, going back to what you said, you're not the same. You are not the same person you were 20 years ago. I'm not the same person I was 20 years ago. How can you use that as a yardstick to measure how you are and to just say you don't deserve to put food on the t food on the table because of something you said 15 years ago? That to me, I I can't even. I, I don't understand it either. You know when people say you changed a lot, but then you tell them no, a lot changed me. Right. The shit that I went through changed me. Yeah. I didn't go through a lot. A lot changed me. So that's exactly my point. 15 years ago, I might have said this. Because of my experiences in those last 15 years, I was taught and now I know different than what I said that night because I had to learn the hard way. And now I'm an advocate for this, 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 and this. So you can't hold that against me. That's just not right. It's just, it's the, you know. But this is what people are, this is what people's careers are being based on and all this stuff. Mm. It's kind of crazy and it's very scary. It's very scary. And for you know? someone, and for someone like a celebrity that's, you know, been in the spotlight for a while, it's just so much more amplified tenfold, especially on social media, like these people commenting cop killer, all these people berating you. It's just, it's just the world we live in. People don't have anything positive to say. No one is looking to empower anyone. No one's looking to lift each other up. It's just negative. What's well, internet yeah, mob mentality. Just, and, 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 and I'm surprised that you, you know, have, I wouldn't say I'm surprised you have social media, but like how do you deal with that? How do you deal with those kind of like things? I got like this guy messaged me yesterday. I was at a wedding in 2000, with my ex-girlfriend. And you know, this is one, you know, this is when I was drinking and doing drugs and I would do so much drugs that I mean, and drink, I would black out. I would literally black out and not remember what's going on. And that was what used to happen. And this guy, like he commented on a video that was very inspirational. It was a very inspirational video. And then this guy, talking to some other guy. This guy's a douchebag. He came up to Binghamton to a wedding, blah, blah, blah. Da, da, and he said he got jumped by everybody at the party. And, and I remember that happened. Because I remember we had a hotel room and I woke up the next day. My jacket was ripped. I was ripped out of my shirt. I had marks everywhere. I don't remember because I was so banged up. But it's like, why emphasize that? Well, you know for a fact that's not where I am anymore. Like, does it, you know, like it's like people see you doing well and they want to bring that up. And to bring like some, that makes to, you better than me. It's, la I did that. And it's, it's lazy. 20, it's lazy. Yeah. 20 years ago. Like they're just fishing for things to. It's more than 20 years ago. More it's than, 23. Yeah. The, the wedding was September 9th, 2000. September 9th, 2000. The Miami Dolphins played the Minnesota Vikings that day. That's my team, the Dolphins. Mm. I remember it was a beautiful Sunday in New York. September's beautiful. We went upstate New York, Endicott. You know, remember, remember in Goodfellas, he goes, remember when he goes, it was before Appalachian. Yeah. Appala they, call, they said Appalachian, but at, in the movie, that the, the people up there, it's called Appalachian. That's the way they say it. It's a town right next door. It's called Endicott. There's like the cider mill they're famous for. So I go up to upstate New York. First, we had the rehearsal dinner. And uh, this is how it all started. We were at the rehearsal dinner. And everything was cool. And then the next day, obviously, the wedding. So my ex-girlfriend was sitting at, she was part of the wedding party. So she was at the days, you know, the table with all the wedding party. Mm -hmm. So I wasn't sitting with her, but I was put in another, you know, thing. So I was sitting with these guys that, you know, thought they were like wise guys, but they weren't. They, they're the real wise guys you speak because they are about something. These guys were not, but thought they were. And I could see right through them, right? So now we go in the back room. You know, like where the women get dressed, like if they're in the wedding party, but we're only back there smoking cigarettes. Okay. So now you have some young kid. He's got that black plastic thing and he's going around putting glasses, you know, empty glasses, he's walking around, putting the empty glasses in the thing. So this one guy was back there. His name was Sammy. Like, you know, thought he was, a, you know. So the little the kid working there, I have a cousin that looked just like him. He was like tall, skinny, and he used to work in a restaurant too. So when this guy said, 
The little kid says, oh, I'm sorry. He goes, you can't smoke. He goes, you can't smoke back here. And he was very nice about it, too, the kid. This guy says, he goes, hey, shut up before I put you in a box. Just like that. And then I said, does that make you feel tough that you're telling this little kid that you're going to put him in a box because he told you you can't smoke? And he did. and then that's how it all started. Mm. Then, you know, like this guy, then people were getting in between. And, and then I was a drunk mess, too, by that point. And the, we were probably there for like 45 minutes. I probably already drank two bottles of white wine. So I was off the charts. Right. So I'm not going to say it was the guy's fault because if I wasn't in the state of mind that I was in, I would have handled it differently. Right. But that's how it all started. And this kid's bringing this up. And uh, yeah, I probably did. He said, he, he, said, he said that I was saying, do you know who I am? I'm the kid in the Bronx town. You know what? I probably did say that. I was probably drunk and this is why I don't do drugs and alcohol anymore. Mm. So I don't act like that anymore. But just to have brought that up, you know what I mean? Mm. It's like, obviously, you saw, I'm totally different. Why wouldn't you say, why would you say, like, dude, I know I remember you from the wedding. I remember we beat your ass because you were acting like a knucklehead. But you know what, guy, man, I, you know, I really appreciate what you're doing and the consistency. And you're always on there spreading positivity and you're helping other people that were in situations like yourself. And, you know, I, I respect that. You know, right. that's what a real man would say. Mm. But to bring that up for what? I agree. I mean, it's just. It's, it has no relevance, bro. If I was still doing that, then you could say the kids have been a douchebag back then, and he's still a douchebag now a douche because bag, he yeah. still does that. And he still hasn't yeah. changed. Yeah. 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 When you were going through that period of in your life where you were in um, the drugs and alcohol, did you ever reach out to uh, De Niro or no. did they no? Because you know, not that I didn't, you know, like I just that's embarrassing, you know. Mm. And it, I feel like you know they've done so much for me already, and they got their own problems. People think because they're big celebrities, trust me. I mean, look, you know, Robert De Niro. I don't know if you know, he just lost his grandson, Leandro. He lost his 19 year old beautiful kid. He was. I, I didn't know that. I didn't know that. Son. I didn't know that. Yeah, 19 years old. He just died last week. Oh my kid. god. He died of an he died of an overdose. A fentanyl overdose. Oh, wow. So, you know, my heart, my prayers go out to, you know, this, you know, this is, it's very real. And, you know, forget about, you know, the movie star De Niro and Dream. This is real people in a real situation that just lost it. He lost his beautiful grandson, his beautiful son because of drug addiction and this fentanyl. This fentanyl is killing so many people. Like, it's almost, I'm like, I'm almost afraid to relapse just because fentanyl's and everything. They have it in everything, and my body's so clean. Probably even touching it could kill me. It's destroying but, the know, city. We have a real, it, it's a yeah. real problem in this city in Vancouver, too. Yeah. It's, it's a series. We're Everywhere. losing a lot of people. In fact, actually, uh, a friend of mine from high school, good guy, and I, I'd lost. I kind of lost touch with him for quite a few years, and I found out on Facebook because his mother had access to his account. And announced that uh, they found uh, police found him unresponsive, dead in a park. He just died by himself. He just overdosed by himself, and he had been going through some things. But he was a genuinely good guy. It just went down the wrong path, and it just ended tragically. And it's in this is a, this is a common story, and it's happening to far too many people. Felt so bad for you know. Uh... Bob De Niro, Drina De Niro, just the whole family. You know, it's so, so sad. You had to see this kid. He was like a beautiful kid and he had a lot going on. He was, he had been in movies and so sad that this, this is happening. Mm. You know, it really is. You know, and, going back to the thing, one of the things that you touched on earlier about having a good support group. And that's something, I mean, we've talked about this with, with previous guests too, that have had all sorts of challenges in their lives is that that's that's so important and something that I feel like we've lost a little bit of, of that sense of community where, where where everyone nowadays we're all so concerned about our own lives where we've got our faces buried in our cell phones and we don't want to talk to people you always have the people always have this kind of attitude of like don't talk to me I'm super busy and 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 that's we, we've definitely lost something and we don't want to have real conversations like like we're all having conversations right now like i and i will totally admit like i heard had certain preconceived notions about 
wh how you were or who you are as a person just by what I read on the internet. And you've completely changed my mind now having this conversation. And I think we need to have more of these types of real conversations, like real true dialogue with people to understand them too. That's like, you know, there's, there's a human being behind this you know, facade, whatever you see as a celebrity, as an entertainer, there's a human being behind here. Right. You're absolutely, no, you're absolutely right. And I think, you know, a lot of people just never take the time to actually get to know the human being. You know what I mean? Mm. They just want to go, you know, based on a Google search or whatever else it may be. And it's very unfair because it costs people careers and, you know, just being able to put money on the, I mean, food on the table for their family, just being able to, you know, so... Yeah, and I think that goes back to, you know, I can even tie this into relationships in general. I see a general trend with people just not working at maintaining relationships. Because as far as I'm concerned, you never stop learning and you have to keep working at this stuff. Like I work at my, my relationships at work. I work on my relationships with my friends and family all the time. And I'm not perfect. I make mistakes, but it's something that I feel like you have to constantly work at it. And I, I feel that a lot of people give up in that way. And that's why you see higher uh, percentage of marriages breaking up and just people not getting a lot, like going back to what I said earlier about, you know, having disagreements with friends, ending relationships that you've had for decades because of something, you know, some kind of political ideology that you don't agree with and we've definitely lost something and i feel like we kind of need to get back to that we've gone too far extreme to one side and i just feel like surrounding yourself with with people that are of a positive influence that you know if there is something that is missing in your life you need to find a way to sort of what is it that you're missing try to figure that out and find a way to to bring that back into your life and just figure out something like whatever it is that you're interested in, find some kind of avenue, some kind of positive attitude, like what you're doing now with, um, you know, spreading a lot of positivity. I think that's a fantastic thing. You work, you work with kids now and, you know, and you haven't given up your career. Not only kids, not only kids, old, you know, adults, right. addiction doesn't yeah. discriminate. You got, you know, people in their fifties and sixties that I work with as well. Mm, you know, I great. try to talk to, you know, listen, and you know, like I do these videos and, and I say this a lot. I don't ever want people to think I'm speaking on these things like I'm some sort of authority, like I'm some certified, you know. No. A lot of this stuff I need to incorporate in my own life. And, and sometimes it's something that I'm lacking. And the reason why I speak about them is because now I put myself in that in a different position rather than being the guy who's struggling this way. You kind of almost made your weakness your strength. And because you made it a strength, now you're held accountable by the people you're saying these things to, to actually do it and be the way you say you are. That's and sometimes smart. people say, oh, you're so much different in your videos. And sometimes I do struggle. I'm not, I'm not perfect. Sure. You know what I mean? I'm not perfect. This is mm -hmm. just the way it is. Sometimes I'm like, damn, I need to work on this. So this is the second time this week somebody said that I did this. So you know what? Let me try to figure out a video right now that can actually help me. Because while I'm helping me, I'll be helping everyone else, whoever watches my video. Yeah. Everyone else. But you know what I mean? I, because, I, I, well, I hear what you're saying. And based on what, what, you're, what you just described, and th would you say that making those videos is almost a form of therapy for yourself to work through this, not just helping other people, but also working through things you're, for yourself too? You're absolutely right. That's why I do that. And people try to call me out. Like, oh, you, you're one way in your videos. I never said I was Mother Teresa. I'm flawed just like every other human being. Right. And they, I may have more flaws than your average person. Right. But it's okay because I'm willing to work on them and I'm willing to get better. Mm. And I'll do what I have to do to get there. You know what I mean? And, so as long as I'm going to make the effort, that's the way, that's what counts. And, whether it happens or not is, you know, whether it happens or not. But I made the effort. You know, it's about making the effort. And I do make the effort on a daily basis to be right. a little bit better than I was yesterday right. in whatever way. Because that's all we can really do. Because striving for perfection is not of this world. So you just, you know, progress mm. every day. Practice makes progress and just progress, progress. And then eventually Absolutely. that'll, that progress will add up to something substantial to where you have something to show for it. Mm. And say, because of this positivity and the way I've lived my life, now I have created this. I have this business that I've been working on. And now it's very lucrative and I'm able to give my 
wife and kids so much and give them a better life. Yeah. Is you know there, what I mean? this is there is anything you want to talk, talk about? Because obviously you haven't given up on, and there's no reason to give up your creative side. You obviously talked about writing. You have an interest in that. Yeah, no, I am writing. I have yeah. everything on, on index cards, but it's being put on. Yeah, I, yeah. I love it. I and, have a real story. Yeah. And there's no reason why you can't keep doing that. Um, no, do you want to talk, do you want to talk about your business at all or? Well, I, I mean, I don't have a business, but I'm saying that's something that people could work, you know, work toward, you know, right. I mean, okay, obviously, I you know, I'm director of public relations at More Life Recovery. Yeah. I'm still, still acting. But like I said, obviously it's, you know, it's harder mm. to get roles than it was years ago. I mean, you know, there's, there's a lot that's happened and I'm okay with it because I did it to myself. But it doesn't mean that I can't keep trying mm -hmm. and it doesn't mean that I can't use what I have in my own mind and what I've seen and what I've lived. Because, you know, it's it's you know, there's a lot there, a lot more than your average person has seen. It's I've just, seen things for worthy of five life, you know, five lifetimes. Right. So, you know, there's a lot there. But all this stuff now is not meant to be to glamorize bad things. It's more to help to, to for for people to see the authenticity in what these this world is or this world, whatever I'm trying to depict, to maybe help them deter, like this is beautiful art, I think it was well done, and it was so well done that it's so real and it's so scary that I don't wanna end up like the main character in this film right. because I know this is so real that if I do this shit in real life, this is what's gonna happen. Right. But I wanna make it very, you know, I wanna make beautiful stuff. There's nothing like, like when I watch movies and you know, just acting and just like when it, when it's at its best, there's like, I get a rush, like Marlon Brando, when he, when he brings, when he brings Sonny's body to the undertaker, you remember they come down the elevator yeah. and then, and then they got Sonny's body and he says, I am ready to do the service. When he says, are you ready to do the service for me? Remember? <laughs> and remember he pulls off the thing and he pulls it off his face and just, his eye starts twitching. <laughs> then he says, look how they massacred my boy. He went from that and then he turned back. He, turned, he was a loving, grieving father. The way he went to that, his eye started twitching. And then he composed himself and he got him back together. Mm. Now he's back to the Don. Said, the make dawn. him look so his mother could see him. Right. And he was that strong man again. Just the way that vulnerable side came out for that split second. That's acting. Trust me, that I, scene looked like nothing. Boy, that guy went from that and then composed himself and went back to that. It was amazing. Well, that's the Just thing so I'm, you know, guys, I got, I got to run. Yeah, no worries. We'll, we'll let you yeah, go. Yeah, absolutely. Here. And... Let one Please, last. guys, I feel kidnapped right now. Please. <laughs> I'm, I'm just, I'm just, go ahead, go ahead. Matt, it's just one, one last thing. It's just refreshing to see, man, that you're not, you don't identify yourself as just an actor, as an entertainer, a celebrity. You're more than that. And honestly, would you say that, you know, acting and, you know, being a celebrity is just secondary to what, you know, impacting lives, my like main, you said? My main purpose, my main purpose is to use my experiences to help other people through the experiences they're going through that are similar like mine or to help them never go through that at all mm. to deter them all together and say, dude, I'm not going to do this. Look at Lilo. This guy was in Bronx tale. They found him on a fucking beach. This guy had the world by the balls. And then he started using drugs and look where he went. That's I'm not going to be any different than that. I'm not going to do drugs, you know, stuff like that, but you know, and, and whatever, but you know, listen, movies, that's what I'd love to do. So no one's ever going to stop me from doing that. Mm. You don't want to hire me because of my past. That's fine. I respect it. But that doesn't mean I can't try on my own. And like I said, I got real life experiences that are very interesting. Mm. You know, but when you make these films, it works hand in hand. So there's a deeper meaning than just making art. It also shows the power of sobriety. Because I've been sober for so long and because I've been living my life the right way, I am now able to go back to what I love mm. because whoever it is is deemed me. You know what I mean? And do it even better after all these experiences that you have. Are you kidding me? Yeah. I sat in jail cells like in the box in punitive segregation in a little room for 80 days. You know what I mean? Right. So you know that the anger, the sadness, the disappointment, stuff that you feel while you're in this place, you're stuck in four walls. You can't use the phone. You can't do nothing. You go crazy. You start getting so sad and cried and you're laughing. You go nuts in these places. And these emotions are stuff 
your average person does not feel because you're not in a situation that would ever evoke those emotions. Regular day, you know, like day to day stuff will not evoke those emotions. Mm. That makes you situations like that make you learn who you really are and what makes you tick and what you can take and can't take. And I learned that I'm a pretty strong minded guy with that experience. And I said, if I'm able to get through this and do this with, with, you know, with my dignity and with some, you know what I mean? Pride and, you know, I can also get over drugs mm. because it's all coming from the same place. Mm, you can all do coming anything. from the mind. Absolutely. My mind is telling me that I need this stuff. Well, my mind tells me that I should be in this place sad or this or that. But no, I can change the way I think. And once you do that, you change the way you feel. Absolutely. You know what I mean? Absolutely. So that's just the way it goes. And then I realize I'm a pretty strong dude. There's no way that drugs are going to get the best of me again Absolutely. because of the experience. You know what I mean? So now... When you make these films, like I said, people were like, oh, my God, he's making movies again. That's awesome. And then someone else will say, yeah, because, you know, he's been sober and he's been good mm. for 15 years. So they're finally starting to give him a little break. You know what I mean? Mm. But it shows people like, damn, maybe if I start doing the right thing, then eventually I can get back to where I was. Mm. Because it's so hard. You know, like the drugs give you that instant, that instant high. But then you lose everything because of it, the consequences. That coming back is not going to be that fast, instant thing. It's years of work, but it mm. builds character. Right. Bill, you build character along the way mm. because there's some days that are so tough because you realize where you were and now you realize where you are. And sometimes that's a very tough pill to swallow. Just, just like that but ladder you, know you talked about. Yeah. Yeah. But it's like, you know what? I'm a strong guy. I remember what I went through mm. and that was worse than what I'm going through right now. So you know what? Let me just push through this because these thoughts, these, these negative thoughts, they don't last just like urges to do drugs. They don't last, mm. you know? Absolutely. And I know that from experience mm -hmm. when you're younger and you think they do last, you go act and be impulsive based on where you're feeling to try to not feel that way. So you go get high. But then when you're in prison and you don't have drugs and you have to just get through these tough times without anything, you start to realize this stuff doesn't last. It'll be gone in like 10 minutes. Let me just stop thinking about it. Or let me just do some push-ups. And then it's like, you don't have that urge for another month. Mm. Then it's realized like this, and they just get less and less, you know, and then you just learn how to live without all that. Absolutely. And then you become a better human being. And that's just, you know, well, that's just the way it goes. Man, you are a very in inspiring person, man. And I appreciate all of this, man. This is, this is very great. I love what you're doing. And, I'm going to watch that movie again probably today after this. And, you know, you've... Yeah, that's, uh, what, that's when I had hair like you. Uh, <laughs> hey, man. Hey, <laughs> man. Know, but, you know... <laughs> you got a haircut like me? You, yeah. You look, got the haircut I, like me? I, 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 hey, should, we got I, got, the, I got a shaved head, too. Yeah. Yeah, we got the same barber, huh? <laughs> <laughs> well, Lilo, man, I really appreciate you coming on and taking the time out of your day to come on and talk about this. It's... Um, you know, you've, you're going to be impacting a lot of people and it's going to impact a lot of people that on our, on our side, who our Absolutely. audience and our, and our followers, they're going to love this. And, uh, thank you, man. I mean, I, I couldn't thank, thank you. you guys. Enough. I appreciate the opportunity. Thanks. And keep so me posted. Let me know what I can do to promote it on my end Absolutely. or however, if you have, if you have a certain and, way you want to do and it. And by the way, right, guys? one last thing I will say, it is criminal that it took so long for the Bronx tale to come out in high definition on blu-ray it only had oh, really? a dvd release for decades and it came out in 2018 it, i don't know why it took so long but it, it the movies never look better you're fantastic thank you so much for your time today and you know what this 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 uh september 30th is going to be a 30 year anniversary of the film Ooh, so wow. with that being said i'm sure they're going to come out with a digitally remastered uh, yeah you know 4k I mean? that's, 4k that's very awesome there you yeah. go yeah. It's a lot. Of, the new version, De Niro and Chaz come and do a little commentary in your living room too. Oh no, I'm man, just <laughs> yeah. it's a dream. It's a dream. All right, we'll Thank let you, you go. Guys. Thank, Thank you so much. God God bless. Thank you, Lilo. Cheers. Have you too. Take care. All right, Thank bye. -bye. You guys.